I want you to think about your dream. Hey, boys and girls, this is time for the Michael V Show. Hey everyone, welcome back to a micro episode of The Radical Humanist, a podcast that believes in your right to live free of the social and emotional constraints that limit your human potential. I am Michael V, and if you're not familiar with the concept of a micro episode, basically, uh, this is where I take a little time in between full episodes of The Radical Humanist um, just to sort of either fill in the blanks or uh, do a little bit of a deeper dive on a subject that we've covered in the past. Uh, or maybe uh, attack a subject that's only tangentially connected to something that we were discussing, or sometimes I just have something on my mind and I need to get it out there into the world. Um, it is just me. Uh, Dr. Thomas Coleman is not here. It is a shorter episode, hence me, Mike, shorter episode, micro, micro episode. Yes, it is a cheap gimmick, but when you're trying to make a name for yourself in the world of self-help and mindfulness, Sometimes you have to resort to cheap gimmicks. Um, truthfully, I had uh, really no intention of recording anything today. Um, it's been a hell of a week. Um, I, a lot of my friends, uh, my close friends, some family members, and actually some listeners of this podcast have been having a, um, a rough week. There's apparently something in the air, something in the water, something with the moon, something with the stars. I, I can't account for it, but... Um, a lot of you out there that are close to me personally have uh, you're struggling, and I and I uh, and I feel for you. I do. I I, I don't just feel for you. <clears throat> I feel with you. Um, and I've spoken to some of you um, on the side, and you know, in person. Um, this isn't just a, a podcast world. This is this is my real everyday life, um, and people that I interact with on a daily basis. Um, it just so happens that. <clears throat> I'm lucky enough that they bothered to tune into this show. And for that, I am grateful. And so um, I want to take a few minutes today and I want to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, one is that, um, like I said, a lot of you out there are struggling. And, um, and I understand. And, you know, Tom and I are... I mean, we do this and we do our best to, to help where we can. Um, I mean, that's the whole point of this, uh, to, to have a voice and for you to have a voice and somebody that you can talk to. And again, um, I feel incredibly grateful, incredibly grateful, uh, that I have this avenue and that people are in fact using it. Um, I, I, on the very first episode, I claimed that, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I do have enough of them. Um, and if I don't, um, we can find one together and that's exactly what's happening. So to all of you that are struggling out there and that all of you that have reached out, I don't know what it is with this week. I, uh, you know, 2021 was supposed to be the year that everything turns around and it seems like <clears throat> seems to be a little bit more of the same. Um, but specifically I want to address an email that I got, um, I, it, it came to me about three days ago and, uh, it's fairly significant and, uh, it, it hit a lot of nerves. And for a lot of you that are struggling out there, um, I have a feeling that this will touch on some of that as well. Um, and that's really why the reason why I wanted to do this today. Um, it just seems that all of these things are sort of converging at the same time. Um, and I thought it was... Um, I thought it behooved me to go ahead and, and address it. Whether or not it does anything for anybody's, anybody's guess, but I'm putting it out there. So like I said, I... I <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I received an email. Uh, came in three days ago. Um, and I'm just going to read it the way it was given to me. And then I'll get into it. So it starts out, Dear Radical Humanists, my name is Jessica, and up until very recently, I lived with my husband of 23 years in the home we built together in Cabot, Arkansas. I won't bother with the details, but we're no longer together, and as time goes on, I become more and more depressed. 
I'm not in any harm right now as I'm typing this, but I don't know what to do anymore or how much longer I can go on. I have lost my love of everything and my will to live along with it. I think about killing myself constantly, and the more I think about it, the more it seems like the only real escape. This is not the life I wanted for myself, and I don't and won't and can't continue on like this. I'm not looking for help or hope. I know you're going to tell me to seek help or go to a doctor and get treatment. And I'm not expecting two random podcasters from New York to have any solutions. The truth is, I want to die. It's all I think about day and night, and it feels like only a matter of time before I get up enough courage to go through with it. Not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not even this month, but everything feels like I'm falling, and it's only a matter of time before I hit the bottom. The only reason I'm writing this is because you've both talked about suicide before, and on your Woke episode, Michael mentioned he once felt the same way. He said he went away on one last vacation with the intention of coming back and ending it all. One last final hurrah, and then finally peace. But when you guys were talking about it, he seemed happy, almost gleeful, like he was bragging, and you both were laughing about it. I don't understand why this would be ever something to celebrate or even try to joke about. I mean, I want to. I just don't understand how this is possible. All I keep thinking is, why me? Why did this happen to me? I didn't ask for any of this. I never wanted any of this. What did I do? What could I have done differently? How is any of this possible? I want this pain to go away. I want to go back to when things were easier. I want things to be the way they're supposed to be. How do I get through this? When will it end? I need help and I don't know what to do anymore. What got you from a place of wanting to end it all to where you can make jokes about it? What do I do? Signed, Jessica. Now, I want to, <clears throat> I want to preface this by saying that I have had a few conversations via email with Jessica since she sent that. And um, we have sort of gotten to a better place. Um, right out of the bat, I'm going to tell you that Jessica is not her real name. I changed it for the sake of recording this. Um, it's not important what her real name is, but everything else in that email it is exactly as it was written to me. Um, so first and foremost, she is okay. Um, I, I'm not going to say that, you know, I was responsible for her being okay. Um, but I think I was able to... <clears throat> give um, a measure of clarity, if that makes sense. Um, yes, I understand exactly how she feels. I understand exactly where she is. I mean, to the best that I can, everybody's situation is different. But this email touched me because it it it's dripping with desperation. And I know what desperation looks like. I know what desperation feels like. I know what it sounds like. I can spot desperation across the street through clothing. Um, you know, my, my superpower is to, is to be able to recognize that, that hidden pain or sometimes, sometimes it's not even hidden, but I know depression when I see it and I only know it because I've been there and because I, I still find myself there. It's not like I'm, you know, a hundred percent through this and, and, you know, I, I'm ready to dish out, you know, worldly advice. <clears throat> That's simply not the case. The only thing I have to offer is experience. Um, and to that end, uh, I want to address a couple of things she said here because it is important. Um, and, and she's right. She's right. I, we did talk about this on the on the woke episode, and I did. I can see how it would sound like I was being glib or flippant about my particular situation, my experience, and it, it, it's not to sound flippant. I'm not. I am not somebody that would joke about this or make light about it because it, it really is not a joking or light matter. I mean. You know, I have always said, <clears throat> excuse me, I have always said that it, it's not depression. People don't kill themselves because of depression. 
people kill themselves because of desperation. Um, you depression renders you for the most part immobile or it did in my case. I didn't have the energy to kill myself. Um, I wanted to, I, it's all I wanted to do. In fact, the only thing that ever brought me any joy when I was in that place was the idea that one day I, uh, you know, I had the ability to end it all. And that knowing that at any time I could, I could literally pull the plug. I could literally just flip the light switch. I could, you know, it, that was the only thing that gave me any measure of comfort. Um, but aside from that, being depressed, suffering from depression renders you for the most part in, in my case, immobile. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't, all I wanted to do was die, but I didn't have the motivation to make it happen. Desperation forces you into action. Desperation is the thing that makes you move. You can't fight desperation. Desperation comes at you hard and fast and from every side. It forces you to get up. So depression will bring you to the edge of the bridge, but depression is what makes you jump. I'm sorry. Depression brings you to the edge of the bridge. Desperation makes you jump. And so there is a, there is a difference. There's, there's a significant difference. For those that didn't hear the episode, I think it's important that I, um, I backtrack and I explain what that situation was. So, um, I had gotten, I was, I was in the very beginning of, uh, what I can only describe as a hellacious, hellacious divorce. I mean, an absolutely hellacious divorce and it tore everything out of me. Um, there is a physical component to this in which, you know, I lost essentially everything that I, everything that was associated with my prior life, I, I lost everything, um, house and wife and the whole family, everything, all the, all that stuff. But, but that wasn't what was important to me. In fact, it's still, you know, house and tangible items and all that bullshit. I mean, it's not important. Um, but the, the divorce itself tore everything from me. Um, I, I really truly was left, um, devoid of anything internal. Um, I was like a gaping wound. All I could do was, was hemorrhage sadness. Um, I, I, you know, I would literally cry myself to sleep. I would have horrific nightmares the entire time and I would wake up crying and I wouldn't know, like there would, there was no specific, you know, when you, when you start crying, there's something that usually triggers it. But when you're asleep and you wake up and you're actually crying while you're, while you wake up, you know, it, there's no way to prepare for that. And there's no way to fight it. There's no way to combat it when, you know, there, there are lots of tried and true techniques when you're depressed and sad and to, you know, to try to get your mind off of it and to other things. But when you're, when you're sleeping, you're completely defenseless. There's, there's nothing. And so being bombarded with <clears throat> just chronic sadness and depression and grief and agony and sorrow and remorse and regret all the time, constantly, no, with, without a moment's sort of reprieve all day, every day, every single day, morning and night. And, and in my sleep, I had gotten to a point where I couldn't take it anymore. I simply could not take it anymore. Um, and, and the only thing I wanted to do was die. And I had, <clears throat> um, not only did I had, uh, ideations, but I, you know, I practiced it. Um, I, 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 I researched it. I, I would spend hours online, you know, looking for the best way to do it and the quickest way to do it and the, the least messy way to do it and all that, all that stuff. Um, I, I mentioned this before I can tie a hangman's noose in my sleep if I really wanted to because of how much practice I had. And so, um, I had been going to Key West, Florida for years. I don't know, 27, 28 years, something like that. every single year without fail, sometimes two, sometimes three times a year. It, it is quite literally my home away from home. <clears throat> 
there's something amazing about that town that I feel this deep, truly spiritual connection with. <coughs> I'm really sorry, I keep coughing. And um, it's a town that always brought me inner peace. And that's funny to say because if you've ever been there, you know it's just this wild shit show party party kind of town. But <clears throat> there's there's three different versions of Key West. But three different versions that I can see um, for those who haven't been there. There is, in fact, the big, you know, drunken party town where it's, you know, it's five o'clock somewhere. And, you know, there's Margaritaville and people are just drinking everywhere all day, all the time. There is that. And then there's a somewhat professional side to Key West that most people never even bother to look at. But it's obviously at an infrastructure. It's a, it's a working city. So it. it it has professionals, even though, you know, their version of professional is khaki shorts instead of torn jeans. Sorry, I'm having a drink. And then there's, um, there's, a, there's a, a deeply artistic side to that town. It's, it's truly amazing. And all you really need to do is scratch the surface just a little bit, just a, just a tiny bit, just scratch. Just wipe away some of the party atmosphere and look just a little bit deeper and you will find a town that is entrenched. It is literally dripping with amazing people, amazing artistic people, writers and, and performers and poets and painters and sculptors, folk artists and traditional artists. It, it really is, is astounding. And, and there, there are some really, you know, there's some big expensive galleries, art galleries in Key West. What the people I'm talking about, they exist in between the cracks. They, they literally exist in the alleyways and under awnings and in the back room of somebody's house. Um, but they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And all you have to do is look. And once you see one, you start to, you start to see the others. And, and it's incredible. And, and I've never... <clears throat> Not once in all the years that I'm going there have I ever had a bad experience. In fact, just the opposite. Every single time I go, I have some amazing, almost otherworldly experience that, you know, sounds like I'm making it up, but it, it does in fact happen. And it only happens to me when I go there. It doesn't happen anywhere else. And, and, and these artists and poets and writers and songwriters and singers and dancers and all that, they're mixed in with this insane collection of actual pirates and ne'er-do-wells and, and bootleggers and people hiding from something. So you have this great, almost free sort of this, this, this freedom of expression mixed in with people who are kind of shady and under the radar, but they, they coexist perfectly. It's this incredible microcosm. It's this amazing balance. And so I have always felt this and, and I have always felt this connection to the town because I feel like for the most of my life, I have straddled that line between the right and the maybe not so right, but not in a harmful way, a pirate, but kind of a poet as well. And God, does that sound pretentious anyway? So that's why I've always connected with that town. <clears throat> and about, I guess it's three years ago now, I was at my lowest point ever. I did not, I, I, I was anxious. I was excited to end my life. I was looking forward to it. And I said, I want, before I go, I want to see Key West one more time. I want to say goodbye to the town that I love. I, I, I was stripped of the opportunity to say goodbye to the people I loved. And so I was going to say it to the town. And so before I left, um, I took everything I owned, everything. And I, and I, I mean quite literally everything I owned and I got rid of it. I either threw it away, donated it or gave it to friends as, um, Hey, you know, I don't need this anymore. You want it kind of thing without telling them what was happening. I stripped my bed, of the sheets and the blankets and the pillows. I took all my clothes and I donated them. 
I took all my books and I donated them. I threw, I, I emptied my cabinets of food and I threw it all away. I mean, I literally stripped my apartment bare. And the only thing I had left was a loaded shotgun. And I put, I, I put two shells into it and I left it on my bed. There was a, I left the mattress on my bed and I left the, the shotgun on the bare mattress. And I took my bag and um, put some clothes in it and I went to Key West. And I stayed <clears throat> on a sailboat while I was there through uh, Airbnb. I had found this 22-foot uh, sailboat, tiny little sailboat, moored into one of the channels. Meaning, like, I couldn't take it anywhere. It was it was already anchored, and in order to get to it, I had to take a little kayak to it. So I would, you know, I, I met somebody on land. They showed me which boat it was. I jumped in a kayak, and I paddled out to the boat. And that was it. I was there for a week. And <clears throat> I truly didn't have any intention of doing anything other than just sitting on this boat for, you know, a week and and just contemplating and processing and remembering and and just kind of taking it all in one last time. And I was excited to get back. I mean, I loved being on this boat, but I was, ex I was excited to get back and, and finally finish up what I had started. And one night I'm sitting on this boat <clears throat> and, um, and the boat for the most part was very open. Uh, there was a small, a very, very small cabin uh, just big enough for like a twin size mattress, but nothing else. And one night I'm sitting out on the, the bow of the boat and um, there's a storm coming and I can see it coming. It's nighttime, but I can see the storm coming. The, the sky was illuminated. The stars were so bright that they, you could still see clouds, you know, late at night. And this was probably about, I don't know, midnight, maybe one o'clock in the morning. And there was a plastic... Um, a plastic dock made up of like um, these flotation tanks that had been bound together and and tied to the boat and and it what it was was basically like where you would launch the kayak from so you would paddle up to this little floating plastic dock put your kayak there and then climb onto the boat and so I sat with my feet in the water on this plastic floating dock and I watched this storm come and it you could see it. I mean, you can literally watch this thing head right towards you. And I sat there and watched as this storm moved over me and then completely around me. It surrounded me like a cyclone fence. There was, I could hear the thunder. You, uh, you could smell the storm in the air. You know that, you know that smell that when it's, you know, it's, it's humid it's almost like a, it's almost like, it really is like an electric kind of smell. It's an electric feeling in the air. The, the air was very, very hot and very damp. And I heard thunder. It was, it was this cacophonous sound. It was deafening. And I could see the lightning all around me. I, 360 degrees around me, it was circling me. But not a drop of rain fell on me while I was sitting there. Not one drop of rain but maybe 10 feet away from the boat on all and you know on all sides it was raining but there was not a single drop of water on this boat and I sat there for about maybe an hour and a half and I watched this storm <clears throat> and this isn't some this isn't my version of an epiphany. That's not what this is. But I did sit there and I watched the storm and it, it was like it was protecting me. It's the best way I can explain it. This storm was shielding me. And at the same time, it was teaching me. And at the same time, it was showing me. I... I know that sounds far-fetched and <clears throat> poetic, but there's no other way I can explain it. I felt safer in that storm, in that circle of, of air, than I had 
prior to that point, you know, after the realization of my divorce started to set in, my overwhelming emotion was terror. I was terrified. I was, I was lost and I was alone and I was terrified more than anything else. Um, and that terror fed the sadness and the grief and the guilt and the remorse and the regret and all of that. But I was so scared. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know who I was. And sitting on that boat in the middle of this channel in Key West and being embraced by this warm air and being allowed, I was given permission to watch this storm the, the way I did. Somebody let me do that. And they let me do that for a reason. And, and I don't know what that reason is, but at that moment, I said, maybe there's more to life. Maybe there is something else. Maybe there, maybe this depression and desperation and sadness and all of this, maybe it's leading somewhere. Maybe it, it, I needed this in order to see something bigger, to see something more, to be more connected to some, to the, to the person I'm supposed to be. And so I went to bed that night with that thought. And the next morning I got up and there was a message on my phone. I was, you know, I'm in Key West and keep my phone off. I don't need to talk to anybody. But there was a message on my phone. And it was from my brother's ex-wife. <coughs> Excuse me. Which was weird. Because we don't really talk. I mean, we're friendly. You know, we're friendly to each other and we like each other. And But um, she's from Brazil. Um, there's a little bit of a, a language barrier. Um, but she's a great, she's a great woman and, uh, and I love her. Um, but it's not like we were, it, it, it was strange that she would reach out to me and that she would reach out to me, you know, on, you know, that day she had no idea I was in Key West. Uh, nobody did. Well, that's not true. People knew, but I didn't tell them why, obviously. Anyway. And so I called her back and she was just calling to see how I was. Um, just wanted to know how I was doing, you know, anything new in my life and blah, blah, blah. And I told her that I was in Key West and we started talking a little bit and she, you know, I told her that I was really depressed and, you know, I was incredibly, I, you know, I'd just been living with this ultra sadness for the longest time. And she said something to me. <clears throat> she was really good friends with my mother, that my mother and, and her, they, they loved each other. They were like two of a kind. And when I, before I was born, my mother had three miscarriages. This is, keep in mind, this is the late 60s, early 70s. My mother had three miscarriages. And the doctor <clears throat> said to her, look, you're never going to get pregnant. You're never going to be able to carry a baby to term. And we strongly advise you against trying again because it can be incredibly detrimental to your health. It, it can be life-threatening. There's a reason why you're not able to carry a baby to term. And my mother was not having it. <clears throat> if there was anything anybody can say about my mother, it's that when she got an idea when she got something in her head. There was nothing, fucking nothing, that was going to change her mind. Nothing. And she was going to stop at absolutely nothing. Which, now that I say that out loud, I guess I can see where I got my tenacity from. Anyway. So she said to the doctor, you're wrong, and I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to have a baby. My mother wanted a child more than she wanted anything else in the world. It is literally all she wanted. She wanted to be a mother. My mother was one of these people that was born to be a mother. And so 
my father suggested that they try adoption. And my mother was totally open to the idea. She just wanted a child. And so they went through the process and they, it was a long drawn out process and they finally were able to get a baby. They lived in New York. They were able to get a baby from Florida and that's my brother. My brother's adopted. And the day they signed the adoption papers or the day my brother was coming home, my mother found out she was pregnant again. And I think my father had suggested, I don't know this for a fact, but I think my father had suggested that she get an abortion to reduce any risk. Plus they had a new baby coming on, you know, coming along on the way with my brother. And she said, absolutely not. I don't care. We're going to try that. We're going to do this. And so I was born. And aside from being a little jaundiced, I was fine, completely healthy. My brother's wife reminded me of that story on the phone. She reminded me that I fought to get into this life. I fought to get into this world. I fought to be here just to simply exist. I fought. And for that reason, and that reason alone, you don't give up. I don't give up. I do not give up for anything, for anybody. Not grief, not depression, not sadness, not regret, not remorse, not guilt, not anger, not resentment. You don't give up. You fought to be here. You're supposed to be here. There is a reason you are here. And I needed to hear that that morning. I needed to hear that. Now keep in mind, she knew nothing of the storm that I witnessed the night before. This was just a coincidence if you want, if you're the type of person to believe in coincidences. And so I came home. I took the shotgun. I got rid of it. And I started over. I literally started over everything over. And it was at that moment that I said to myself, no, you don't give up. You never give up. You don't stop fighting. I believe, and this is going to sound unbearably pretentious. I do believe that I am here for a reason. I do believe I was meant for more. Now that might sound delusional, And that's fine. Let it be delusional. But it's my delusion. And I will see it to the end. I will see that delusion to its conclusion. And if it concludes with nothing, at least it was my delusion to own. But I know for a fact I am here for something more. I am here for something better. And so when I got home, I started over. And my depression didn't magically go away. I still deal with it every single day. It's still very much a part of my life. But I decided at that moment that I no longer have depression, that it that I am its keeper. It is not mine. It does not cage me. I might have it, but it does not have me. It will not own me. And I will not let it stop me any more than it already has. I will not give it any more power than I already have. It does not own me. And so the reason that I'm able to tell that story and to tell it freely and openly and with no shame is because I lived with shame for a very long time. I lived with fear. And I lived with the shame of fear. And let me tell you a little secret. Shame and fear and guilt are a sucker's package. That's sucker's luggage. That is baggage that you do not need. You do not need to carry around shame and fear like a sack of boulders thrown over your shoulder 
lugging it uphill constantly. You can put that down anytime, any time you want. I am living proof of that, living proof. My baggage was killing me, killing me. That's, that's not an exaggeration. I'm not saying killing is a euphemism. My baggage was ending my life one day at a time, one detail at a time. Every single day. I died every day, but was reborn just enough to die again the next day. That's all I had left was just enough to be stripped of me the following day. But once I put that down, once I alleviated myself of shame and fear of moving forward, the shame of my past and the fear of moving forward, I was finally able to stand up and say, and not just say, but believe, I deserve better. I am coming after this world, and this world better fucking watch out. It had better fucking watch out, because I spent far too long not fucking around. Nothing, nothing inside my brain will stop me ever again. And I know it's there. I know the depression and the grief and the sadness are still there. I know it's there, but it will not control me anymore. And that's how I'm able to tell this story. And it's important that I'm able to tell this story because there's an old saying that your story is the key that can unlock someone else's prison. So share your testimony. And that's exactly what I did. That's exactly what I do. And if I said it in a jubilant matter, matter, it's because I am jubilant about it. It's because I'm here and I'm able to tell you that story. I didn't do what I set out to do. I didn't go out there. I, I, I didn't come back and do what I was going to do, what I had every intention of doing, what I wanted to do. I didn't do it. I came back and I can celebrate because of it. And I can celebrate without fear and without shame. And fucking hell, I will. You better fucking believe that I will. And that's not to sound dismissive of anybody's struggles. Because if there's something, if there's anything I understand, it is struggle. I, it, it's ingrained in my DNA. I, I get it. And I want, for everybody that's struggling out there, I want... To, for them to reach that height that I was able to find for myself. I want them to get to a place where they can, where they, where they can be joyous about the shittiness of the past or the shittiness of a situation. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for all of you. But the only way to get there is to go through it, to own it. The more you hide from these things, the worse they get. The more you try to pretend they're not there and put on a, a happy face and smile, the worse it's going to be for you. Own your failures. Own your mistakes. Own your sadness. Own your depression. Own your desperation. If for no other reason than to get you to the next day, I can't tell you, and I can't tell Jessica, that it's okay. This will, it'll all be okay. One day this will all be okay. Because I'll tell you something. The biggest fallacy you'll ever hear about healing is that time heals all wounds. It does not. It does not. And I fucking hate whoever came up with that phrase. My mother died at 1 p.m. on February 1st, 2014. I have not healed a single solitary piece of myself since that has happened. I have continued on, but I have not healed. And that's okay. I don't think I'm meant to heal from that. I don't think we're supposed to heal from things like that. 
Um, somebody once told me that the loss you feel when somebody dies is equal to the love you shared while they were alive. And I think that's true. I think it's devastatingly sad, but I think it's true. And I don't, I carry that with me as much as I carry her memory, because for me, they're one and the same. They're connected. They, you don't separate those two ideals. But I would never call myself healed. But the pain and the scar that I carry from her death is something I'm proud of. I'm obviously still devastated that she's no longer here, that I can't pick up a phone and call her, that we can't go out for lunch. <clears throat> but I am proud of the scar, and I will wear it proudly for the rest of my life. Um, because it is an ongoing tribute, and it is an important part of her memory. But healed? No. You, you don't heal from it. I once told somebody, I, I don't know, maybe two, two, two or three years after she passed away, um, they wanted to know how I was doing. And I said it was like a spear that was shoved into my chest, and it's still there. I've just learned how to button my shirts up around the spear now. But the spear is still there. That's not healing. That's adapting. And adapting is not healing. And so when people say to you, time heals all wounds, that's just an empty platitude. It's absolutely meaningless. I carry a stain from that time in Key West. It's part of me. It's ingrained in my DNA. And, and that's okay. I want it to be part of my DNA. It's, it's important that it's there because it is my cheerleader now. I've taken it and I've repurposed this, this memory, this, this activity, this stain, this horrible, horrible spot on my life. And I've repurposed it and I use it as my own personal cheering squad to keep me moving forward. And sometimes you need to be your own cheerleader and that's fine. You don't always need, you know, an external source to be your cheerleader. You can find that in yourself. It exists. You just need to tap into it. So it's hard for me to buy into that, the whole idea that time heals all wounds. And that's not something that I would ever say to somebody in Jessica's position. What I would say is that I don't believe that happiness is a choice. I, I think that's that's silly, and I think it's another one of these stupid empty platitudes that people who have nothing better to say tell you. And I would not tell you that if you're in a position like this, or a position that's somehow related to this, I wouldn't I wouldn't stand at a pulpit and say to you. You cannot put your happiness into somebody else. You must find it within you first. If you cannot find your happiness within you, you'll never find it elsewhere. Because that's also a whole lot of bullshit. You absolutely do find happiness in, in external sources. To, to, to say that you don't is crazy. Other people, other things, other creatures on this planet make you happy. Why don't you try telling a mother somewhere that... She shouldn't put her happiness in her children. She shouldn't find happiness in her children's accomplishments and achievements and their and their their becoming adults. Tell, try telling any parent that. How you'll you'll be fucking laughed at. My dog used to make me incredibly happy, and when my dog was no longer around, I was not as happy. So yeah, the, uh, things out there make you happy. So to say that you can't find happiness in external stimuli, fucking madness. Don't listen to those people. However, that being said, you must find the calm within yourself first, especially in situations like Jessica's. You must find that calm. That is how, when she says she doesn't know how it's possible that I'm able to 
make jokes and, and be okay with this because I was able to find the calm. I was able to, to quell that storm inside me. The storm, the external storm that was around me helped me to quell the storm inside of me. And so how do you get through this, Jessica, and people like Jessica and people in Jessica's position? First, you must quell that storm. You must find that calm inside of you. You cannot move forward with internal chaos and internal turmoil and try to move forward in a natural way. You will only project that turmoil into somebody else or onto something else. And that will just make it worse. You know, it, it is apropos that I'm recording this now because this Monday is Martin Luther King Day. And I'm not going to be one of these fucking people that goes around quoting Martin Luther King because what the fuck do I know about him? I'm a, I'm a jerk-off white guy from fucking suburbs of Long Island. What right do I have to quote Martin Luther King and, and sound all pretentious about that. So I'm not going to do that, except right now I'm going to do that. But I promise this will be the only time I do that. Martin Luther King said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. That is about as succinctly as I could ever put this. You have to listen to those words. You have to absorb those words. You have to truly embrace them. When Jessica said, what, or asked, what got you from a place of wanting to end it all to where you can make jokes about it? What do I do? You keep moving forward. You have to keep moving forward. You find ways, you find things, you find reasons. Even if you know these reasons are bullshit at first. I spent longer than I care to admit every morning lying to myself just to get out of bed. And I knew I was lying to myself, but I needed that push just to get up and get going. You do need to find the things. But also, it is important to acknowledge that the external stimuli was a source of happiness. I'll, I'll tell you something. When I was on that boat in Key West, if I had gotten a phone call from my ex-wife at that moment, and she said, look, Michael, let's, why don't you come home and we'll talk about this. I would have jumped off that boat. I would have swam to shore. I would have run to the airport. I would have gotten on any plane that was getting me closer to New York. I would have landed at any airport within the tri-state area. I would have gotten on any bus, any train, any subway, in any cab, and I would have gotten back to my house as quickly as humanly possible. Because at that moment, that would have made me happy, blissfully happy, ecstatically happy to be able to have that opportunity. At that moment, would have solved all of my troubles. They would have disappeared. And I know that for a fact. I know that wholeheartedly. But it would have solved the problems of those days. It would have solved the turmoil that was currently residing, the storm that was currently happening. But it would not have solved the real issues. It wouldn't have solved the bigger problems, the bigger pictures, the things that weren't going that weren't getting recognized. But beyond that, it would have stunted my growth completely. The only reason I'm sitting here and I'm able to talk to you about this in my flippant manner, in my, if it comes off as, as, as bragging or gleeful, the 
only reason I'm able to do that is because of the growth that I was that I was fortunate enough to experience because of the situation that occurred. Without the trauma, without the pain, without the depression, without the desperation, without the guilt, the grief, the sadness, the sorrow, the, all of it, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't be the person sitting on the side of the microphone talking to you. I wouldn't be somebody that was getting emails from people like Jessica. When I said earlier that I know that I'm meant for something else, that something else would not have occurred without getting me to that boat in the first place. I needed to get there. I needed to hit that bottom in order to become the person that I am now. And I am incredibly, incredibly proud of the person I am now. I'm not who I want to be at the moment. I'm, on, I'm getting there. I'm on my way there. This is the journey there. But I'm not who I was. And had my phone rang, and had I answered it, and had I run to the airport, and jumped on a plane, and then on a bus, and then on a train, and then on a subway, and then in a cab, and then back to my old house, I would have none of this growth. I would have none of this insight. I would not be able to wield these words the way I am now. And to me, there's nothing more valuable than growth and insight. Nothing. Because the person I am now, the person I'm becoming, is far more important and far more relevant than the person that I was. And so I take a large measure of comfort in that. Yes, I still have the guilt and I still have residual grief and I still have remorse. But for me personally, the door is open. The shades are draw are have been pulled back. The window is in full display. I can see the bigger picture now. And every time I look at it, the picture gets bigger and bigger. The shades get pulled back more and more. And that is a that is a direct result of everything that happened. Wouldn't be here without it. Just wouldn't be here. Wouldn't be doing this. Wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> for better or for us. <laughs> so, you move forward. You take baby steps. Let them be baby steps. Take a step forward. Fall back. Stand up again. Take a step forward. Fall again. Stand up. Take another step forward. And wait and then take another step forward. And now you're two spots ahead of where you were. And that's progress. And that's all you need. That's all you need. Nobody starts out by running a marathon their first day. This is the same thing. I built myself up from nothing, from dust, from debris, from ash, from rubble, from remains. I built myself back up one piece at a time. And this time, I am the person I'm supposed to be. I am complete. Prior to February 1st, 2014, I was Carol's son. That's who I was. I was Carol's son. After that, I don't know who I was. I, I didn't know. All the things that were familiar were now alien to me. Everything. My friends, my family, my dog, pots and pans, dishes, my car, my job. All everyday things that somehow felt completely different. They didn't feel real. Nothing felt real. I was on the outside looking into something that I no longer recognized. And it's because I didn't know who I was. Because I, because I wasn't anybody. Because up until that point, I was Carol's son. And now, suddenly, without warning, I wasn't. 
up until my divorce, I was a husband. I was my wife's husband. It's who I thought I was meant to be. And after that, I wasn't anymore. And so again, what was left over, the little that was left over from my mom's death was now completely gone, completely stripped away. And after that, I spent an impossibly long time being disconnected from absolutely everything. From the world itself. I've mentioned this before. I was a ghost. I floated in between days. I haunted every place I ex- that I ended up, be it home or work or a friend's house or an event. I didn't show up. I wasn't present. I, I haunted these places. And so from the rubble of that, one step at a time, moving forward one step at a time, I rebuilt myself. Literally, atom by atom. And so that's what you do. And it doesn't matter where or when It doesn't matter how. You can be anywhere and start again. If you didn't take that first step today, wake up and take it tomorrow. If you don't feel like you're ready to take it tomorrow, take it the next day. Every day is a chance to start. Every day is a new piece, a new component a new part of you, that you, you and you alone have the power to add back into you. Shit happens. Bad shit happens. I know that sounds glib. But it does. And we can't control it. We can only deal with it As it happens and after the fact, it's the same thing with personal change. You can do nothing about the past. You can't change the past. All you can do is either accept it or you can languish in hell over it. And so you can do nothing about the past. But you can control the future. You cannot do anything about the pages you've read. Or the pages you've written. But you can control what you write next. You can control what you read next. You can control how you move forward. And it's all about moving forward. And so... When Jessica says, what do I do? You fly. And if you can't fly, you run. And if you can't run, you walk. And if you can't walk, you crawl. But whatever you do, you keep moving forward. Thank you all for listening. Catch you next week. So tell everybody you know It's time for the Michael D. Show It's time for the Michael It's time for the Michael It's time for the Michael D. Show It's time for the Michael D. Show It's time for the Michael D. Show So tell everybody you know It's time for the Michael D. Show It's time for the Michael D. Show It's time for the Michael D. Show it's time for the Michael, it's time for the Michael, it's time for the Michael he show. It's time for the Michael, it's time for the Michael, it's time for the Michael he show. So tell everybody you know, it's time for the Michael he show. It's time for the Michael, it's time for the Michael, it's time for the Michael he show.
It's time for the Michael. It's time for the Michael B. Show. So tell everybody you know. It's time for the Michael B. Show. It's time for the Michael. It's time for the Michael. It's time for the Michael B. Show. He knows about chickens and shit. <laughs>